Welcome to another VV Meet the Artist. And today I am lucky enough to have the illustrious Addy Granoff with me. Addy, thank you so much for taking the time to come chat with us. Of course. Yeah, happy to do it. Today, obviously, we're going to be talking about a lot of the artist proofs that you have on the platform already. Specifically, all new x number 16 is going to be releasing on Monday at the time of this recording and going to Friday. But before we do that, Adi, I wanted to take some time to kind of go into your backstory. A lot of the people that collect on VV are newer collectors and they're kind of discovering art and artists for the first time. So if you're willing, I'd love to do sort of a origin story uh, of you. Good, yeah. I watched an interview with you that was many years back and you talked about where you were raised in Bosnia when you reached 14 or 15, you had the option to choose a trade and you chose art. And there was just a lot of things happening in Bosnia at that time. And I was just always interested to know, did you choose art just because you're like, that's what I'm going to be best at? Or was it sort of like an escapism as well? Uh, no, I mean, um, before kind of the, the political troubles and then the war, I was already, you know, really into comics and drawing and uh, science fiction in general. Yeah, I really liked uh, uh, science fiction books and movies. And I really got into uh, especially French and Italian comics uh, when I was a kid. And then um, the way it worked in well, former Yugoslavia at the time, they would do like a, a aptitude test uh, at, I think we were 14, 13, 14, and kind of give you an idea of where your strengths are and which kind of school you should go to, what you should pursue. And mine was actually engineering, uh, which, you know, in hindsight, it makes a lot of sense because of the way I approach things. But I was just so into art. And when they actually said, oh, you know, you're really uh, quite... Uh, like your aptitude or whatever is is really quite strong for engineering. I said, how about art? And they almost seemed, you know, disappointed. And they said, oh yeah, you know, that, that'll be fine as well. So um, I uh, had to apply and do um, a test for, well, first you have to apply for the art school. Uh, and then if you are uh, accepted, then you do a test. And then uh, uh, based on that scoring of the test, then you are either obviously accepted and reject or rejected. Which actually now, also in hindsight, seems quite cruel because we were all like 14 years old and having to make these quite, you know, significant choices. But that's that's how it, it really started. And I don't really know if I was taking it quite seriously at that stage yet. Uh, but then actually what you touched upon, because uh, I was equally into music and I was playing bass and had a band and all of that stuff. And I was that kind of splitting my time between the two. And then at one point, uh, probably around the time I was 16, I realized that I couldn't do both to the best of my abilities. And I had to do some, you know, soul searching or whatever. And I decided, okay, I'm going to sell the bass and I'm going to dedicate all my time to, to um, art. That's, that's so interesting to hear, especially the aptitude for engineering, which just makes so much sense. Whenever you look at, I think I have one of them, like the extremists, Iron Man, like there's examples of where you illustrate multiple angles of an Iron Man suit and you're showing like the breakdown of all the components. It is very engineering. That kind of uh, uh, natural, I guess, interest I have in how things function uh, really did, you know, I didn't get it at the time when I did that test, but they obviously from the test quite correctly concluded it because now I'm really into it. Uh, you know, engineering and working on old cars and, you know, working on machines, figuring out how they work and stuff. Uh, it's just that I kind of came at it from almost a different angle. So when I, like, as you mentioned, Iron Man, my mind almost requires to be able to understand why something is the way it is. So if I draw it in 2D, I have to understand how it would be from a different angle in order for it to me, in my mind, make sense. Uh, so that that is that kind of uh, you know uh, engineering element to it, uh, and you know I don't in life have, as far as I know, OCD, but in art I definitely do. It's like I have to understand what it is that I'm doing, why I'm doing it, and um, so yeah, that's really really interesting. And so sort of moving along in the origin story, uh, tragedy, you know, when it comes down to it, the Bosnian War occurs, and then. You and your family need to leave to go to America, essentially, right? I mean, that's kind of, yeah, the, the, the A to Z. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the war started, yeah, I was about six months into that art school. So I would have been just, I turned 15. And then uh, the war started and sadly, you know, for a year, 
I couldn't go to school at all because, the, you know, I was, I'm from Sarajevo, so we were under siege during the war. Uh, so we were being shelled daily and uh, uh, shot at and, um, you know, the food ran out, the electricity ran out, or not ran out, but stopped water, all of that stuff, you know, we were reduced to kind of almost like a cave, uh, like living in a, but I kept drawing and that's when it really did become escapism because I had nothing else to do other than read books and draw. And uh, we didn't have electricity, so at night we would make these uh, oil burning lamps because, you know, candles got burnt up within the first couple of months. And then after that, you know, people would come up with these ingenious ways to make things, you know, so for light, we would uh, make these oil lamps and uh, drawing under that. And then also listening to music, I uh, hooked up a dynamo to a exercise bike and then to a, a Walkman. So you would, but it was a really old school Walkman. So when it would go, you know, the, the, the current would alternate, uh, you know, fluctuate, the speed of the tape would fluctuate. So it would be a, a few friends and I, and we would take turns and have to, you know, there was, a, I don't know what the speed was, but we had to stick to a speed in order for the song to play the way, it, you know, it's, it's supposed to play. So, you know, it, it was awful, but at the same time, it, it, you know, now it has taught me so many things about life and, 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 you know, survival and, and just all kinds of stuff. So, you know, uh, it's, it's, you know, I, I wish I didn't go through it and I wish nobody's going through, you know, would go through war, but for me, it really did, uh, also add a lot of elements to, uh, a lot of the things that I do in, in life and art today. It's, I, I'm, you know. I'm so sorry you, you dealt with that. that. That's a tragedy. But I had seen essentially interviews with you where you talked about the transition to school in America. And for you, it wasn't about competing with your peers because you didn't need to compete with your peers, right? Being the best of your peers in school, that wasn't going to matter for you. You need to be better than the people that were doing it for real. And I was, I was curious, did your experience with what you just talked about sort of temper your work expectations for yourself? which potentially elevated what you were doing. I think because I was removed entirely from, you know, cause I was, I was, uh, you know, in the war for three years and then I was a refugee. Uh, and then we ended up as refugees going to the States. So that entire period of about four years, it was basically like the, you know, from 15 to 19 was removed. So I was removed from knowing normal like development so some things i i you know probably didn't develop socially as i you know as you know, normal people would but on the other hand i didn't also know at what speed i was supposed to be developing as a, as an artist i had obviously developed at a, at a level that was far beyond most people my age especially once i arrived to the states where high school is almost like a just an ext extension of grade school. So you don't really get serious until you get to college. But I got really serious at 15, 16. So by the time I was 19 and I joined this high school in Portland, in Oregon, I was so far beyond, you know, in art, but then everything else, I was like, a, you know, caveman coming into, you know, civilization kind of thing, you know, discovering all these, you know, I, I've never worked on a computer before. And, and, you know, of course, it was, you know, mid-90s, so it's not like I was that far behind. But, you know, by that point, kids have already had, you know, uh, you know, my experience was Commodore 64. And then suddenly there's, you know, Mac. And, and that whole period I, I had completely been, you know, removed from. So it was that kind of stuff that I had to, really, I had to do quite like quick catch up. But then with some other stuff, I was like, oh, why are all these other 18, 19 year olds only now, you know, figuring out what it is that they want to do when I'm fully formed already is, a, you know, I mean, what I thought at the time I would be. So it's, it's kind of just a different, I guess, different speeds of different things. But that's what happens in a very, very, you know, severe environment. And so you had made the transition and, you know, you're dealing with the experience you just talked about with your peers. And I, I was curious at that point. Was it really just head down and grind for you? Like, I just need to keep improving. I need to keep doing the thing. Or was there, whenever initially you were thinking about art, you were kind of torn between music and art. And now you're in a totally different environment that's a little bit more comfortable. There's maybe more things to do. 
was it just 100% art whenever you finally made the transition or did you kind of dabble in other I things did, and did that influence? I you? didn't really think so. It, it's just that now, you know, when I talk to, to some friends yeah, I had back then, they say, oh, I've never met anyone as like, you know, dedicated as you. And I didn't think at the time. To me, that seemed just normal. But also, I think, you know, part of the thing that has to take be taken into consideration, I had quite severe PTSD that has kind of made my understanding of how things were a bit different. So I would sacrifice, you know, going out. So I never, uh, um, I've never had alcohol in my whole life. And it's no reason really other than just, I just never did. I, you know, it, it wasn't part of like that whole war experience. And then by the time I was 19, I was like, well, uh, if I, you know, go get drunk or, you know, whatever, uh, it, it will remove my ability to progress as an artist. And to me, that just seemed like a completely normal thing. So it wasn't something that I was like, oh, you know, I'm gonna, you know, do this. It was more just by that point, I had been conditioned to be a certain way and I just didn't know any better. Uh, and actually that realization came a little bit later and then I actually had struggles kind of readjusting to, you know, kind of normal life. Uh, but in those first few years, you know, we were refugees and it was a very also, still, it was a continuation of this very odd experience, you know, living on, you know, food stamps and in shelters and stuff like that. So you don't still have fully normal kind of whatever normal means. Uh, experience so i just kept drawing you know and then i realized all my like credits whatever they were from from the bosnian and croatian school because i was a refugee in croatia they were all just art credits and in order to graduate high school in the states i would have had to stay until i was 20 and that just freaked me out so i then researched and realized that i could get a ged and move on and go to college with that. So that's what my focus. So immediately within months of arriving in the States, I had already kind of, you know, wanted to keep moving, moving, you know, just, uh, and, uh, so I got the GED that following summer. And then I moved to Seattle to go to a uh, art institute there, uh, within, I guess that would have been maybe nine months of arriving to the States. And I mean, at the time that seemed like a very long you know, when you're 19, it seems like a very long time. But now when I think about it, I'm like, you know, today, I don't know if I could, uh, um, you know, wash a car at that period. It's a whirlwind. So during, you have all these transition processes that are happening and you've kind of made your way to college, right? And in a lot of your interviews written and, you know, verbal like this one, people sort of accredit your first Marvel cover as the first thing or your time at Nintendo, that was the first, for you, like whenever you look back at those early stages of your career, was there a piece or a project that you either contributed to or you completed and you were like, this is going to work. Like this thing that I've been trying to do, it's going to work for me. I am going to be a successful artist. Um, no, I mean, I, I, I had this kind of weird belief, which has been pro proven to be right in, in hindsight as well. But uh, uh, I, I was like, as long as the work is... Um, and I had this kind of idea, like undeniable, you know, then everything else was going to fall into place. But, and I think it's kind of weird to say that it's easy. It's not easy because it's uh but I was kind of on the bottom of like the society as far as, you know, we, we were, you know, literally had nothing at all, but I had this idea that if I create work that is undeniable, everything else will fall into place. And, uh, I think probably by the time I. I finished the Art Institute, I had already had uh, uh, art that was good enough, so I got hired at Nintendo straight from, uh, it was my graduation show uh, at, a, at the Art Institute and Nintendo uh, were doing whatever, uh, came to look at the portfolios and I got hired uh, pretty much straight away. So I didn't really even have that experience of like oh, being out of college job hunting, it literally just kind of went. Uh, but it's all of these years of, you know, drawing and kind of it just, I, um, I guess I was quite smart in deciding how to apply my skill and apply it to a, a art style that was quite marketable. Uh, it also helped that I was, I was already into that kind of stuff. So I was into, uh, um, you know, uh, 
French illustrator, Mobius, and then I was really into Drew Struzan and uh, Amsel, the poster artists and stuff like that. So I was like, okay, you know, I've never seen anybody do that in comics. Uh, I mean, Mobius, of course, but I mean, for like Drew Struzan type of stuff. So if I do that, then maybe that'll be kind of like my ticket to, you know, bigger things. And it eventually did turn out to be that way. Uh, it's just, you know, it, it wasn't quite smooth all the way. Well, I mean, you accomplished your goal. Your art is absolutely undeniable, that's for sure. And you kind of touched on the thing that I also wanted to touch on, and that is science fiction. It's always been an important thing to you. You've said that your affinity for Iron Man is partially because it was the closest thing to science fiction that you could see in that universe, so you really took to it. Um, you kind of mentioned a couple inspirations there for artists, but for people that are looking at your story and being like, how can I, you know build a background what are your two what would you consider to be your two biggest sort of science fiction inspirations what are the two things that you feel have really really inspired you to create? it's even without knowing it you know when i was a kid i really you know i was really into alien aliens and then mad max and you know that whole kind of post-apocalyptic universe and especially with alien I didn't even realize it at the time, but some of my favorite artists to this day were involved in that. So there's like almost like a full circle. Uh, and then, you know, with Blade Runner as well. Uh, so for me, uh, when I really got into art and design and that kind of science fiction, Mobius and Sid Mead uh, were like the two that really blew my mind as, as you know, as a kid. Uh, and uh, it took me a long time actually to find the Sid Mead book that I had as a kid that I had to leave in Bosnia. It took me, I think, 15 years, 20 years maybe to find a copy because it was long. But anyway, I, I digress. But uh, so now I realize, you know, when I watch, or you know, since I've realized when you watch Aliens, uh, the ship is designed by Sid Mead. Uh, Blade Runner, almost everything is designed by Sid Mead. You know, in Alien, uh, of course, H.R. Giger did the, the, you know, the alien and stuff, but the spacesuits are by Mobius. And so I would say probably from, from kind of when I really got serious, those two were the, the, the real biggest influences. And to this day, I just uh, absolutely adore their work. That's amazing. I appreciate you sharing that with us. And sort of on the line of Iron Man, for some of the people who are newer and that are watching, we're so glad you're here. Um, but you obviously worked with the Marvel Cinematic Universe as a, correct me if I'm wrong, but a, a suit consultant and conceptual designer uh, for the suits, correct, for some of the movies. And it's interesting because whenever you look at your art, a lot of it, it kind of looks like, you know, you've placed your camera on your mind, you've placed your lights in your mind, and you've captured a moment. And I always wondered, did your experience working in movies influence your art later or do you feel like your art was just built to be sort of referenceable for movie because I, I was so into uh you know I, I, again in hindsight i realized they were very high quality movies and that's why i mentioned mad max it's some of the best framing some of the best action you know uh, uh cinematography ever created but i was so into it and i think it really influenced the way i try to see things so when I did the Iron Man Extremis book, I really wanted it to be a cinematic experience because that was my, really my first like grand stage kind of entrance to like, you know, present what I can do. And uh, it obviously, you know, sparked something in the, in the whole uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe. I mean, it wasn't even called at the time that it was just Iron Man. Uh, by Marvel Studios, uh, and John Favreau, the director, uh, just really, I mean, genuinely loved that book, and he carried it with him everywhere. Uh, and then when we, um, back in the days of MySpace, uh, we, we got in touch through that, and uh, he asked me originally just to do, like, a promo poster to tease the, the movie, uh, and then uh, as the story goes, uh, the design, I had to do a new design for that poster, and that the design that I did when they then did a presentation, when they hired uh, Michael Riva, who was the uh, production designer of the film, they showed him all of these different designs that were done. That's the one that he said, this is it. And then John Favreau came back to me and said, hey, would you mind joining and helping us design this, uh, you know, I mean, it, it ended up being more, more things than just that one suit, but it, that was kind of the beginning of it. It's such, such an amazing legacy. How, thank you. 
but yeah, the, the, but to answer the question, I think it was all kind of like, again, everything with me seems to be kind of like a full circle thing. So the things I was into influenced the things that I do, which influenced the things that I created that, you know, it don't all kind of goes around. Well, let's transition. I think we've done a pretty good job here. We could talk all day, but you know, I want to be respectful of your time. And so let's transition over to VVM. I'm curious, at what point had you even heard about VV and how familiar are you with VV Digital Collectibles? Um, I, the first time I heard was actually, uh, it came through Marvel. I did a, a Ultraman uh, cover, which was a, a, a collaboration between Marvel. It was an Ultraman cover and uh, VV were doing the Ultraman collectibles. And that's how it, it, the, the first time it happened. Uh, and then I think it wasn't for probably another year or even longer that then they the deal with between marvel and vivi happened and that's when they uh, approached uh, um, me and a few other artists at the beginning uh, about doing these uh one-to-one -one, like digital like uh unique collectibles uh so so that's kind of how how i came to it gotcha and for for those of you watching at home your first artwork, Addy, on Vivi is a poster. It's a Rise of Ultraman poster. It's beautiful. It's, there's a series of them, and it's just a beautiful piece of work, you know, as is everything you create, of course. Beyond just knowing what Vivi is, are you familiar with digital collecting at all, what the concept of I mean, I am, yeah. I'm, I'm, um, actually, it's, it's interesting. It goes way back when a friend of mine who's really kind of much more like with the ear to the ground about these things than I am, was uh, trying to dis explain to me and a couple of other people watch what you know the the whole uh, blockchain thing is, and I remember just thinking I, I don't get this, but uh, now I do. It's just uh, so yeah, you know I, I I I know how it works and I know what it is, and uh, I, I mean I bought a jacket uh, last year. It, it, the jacket itself comes now with a blockchain, so if I sell the jacket on, uh, instead of having to go to the shop. To verify it, you can scan the uh, the chip that it comes in with, and it connects to the blockchain to tell you that it's a genuine jacket. So I think you know the technology, especially last year or a couple of years ago, whatever, got a lot of like bad press for I think all the wrong reasons because the actual technology itself is, uh, I mean, in my opinion, it answers a lot of questions that people have been asking for a very long time. The jacket isn't really to be a collectible it's something i wear but it you know or like when you get to i know that now uh, uh watch companies uh, uh you know luxury watches are started starting to do it as well and yet yeah, it's, it's just a a digital non uh how do you like you can't really mess with that certificate that something what you have is genuine so to me it, you know makes perfect sense traditionally a lot of artists just looked at print you know, and then the internet came along and you could do eBay auctions and Amazon and all these different things. And then it was like quasi digital. And I think what you're saying as well is sort of the beauty of the technology is verification and instant transaction. You know, I mean, it's also a whole new platform for our work. How, how, how is that a bad thing? You know, it's, uh, you know, especially when, uh, you know, if, if print is declining or if, you know, it, it's, it's just, like it's, it's a, just a, not another platform to, uh, present it just like, you know, uh, video was or, uh, digital photography or whatever, you know, it's all kind of a way to reach an audience. And to me, that is always a great thing. If I can reach an audience, uh, and, and, you know, feel good about it. Uh, you know, if I was in some way, uh, cheating him okay but i'm not i'm just you know presenting my work in a in a new way well it's a perfect transition because what i want to talk to you next is about all the art that you already have on vv you kind of were touching on it's a new venue a new place where you can put your different things so what i'm going to do is i'm just going to read through the big list of amazing things that you have we'll pop it up on screen so you can see invincible iron man number one number 80 black widow deadly origin number two she-Hulk number four, and you mentioned it, the Rise of Ultraman poster. In addition, you have some Star Wars and Marvel comics. And when it comes down to it, all the things I've just listed, and there's more, uh, because there's more comics that you're attributed that are on Vivi. But all of this really, 
it represents hours and hours and hours of your life. Like when it comes down to it, whatever we're purchasing a piece of art from an artist, we're purchasing their time and their experience and their passion. I was curious how long on average for proofs specifically for proofs, how long does it take you to start to finish a proof? Like what is the time commitment for something like that? Is there- You mean a piece of artwork that when I, when I do it? Yeah, I mean, most of my art, and actually I think all of it that is on Vivi, it will have been painted traditionally. So it's not hours, it's days. It's actually sometimes weeks. Uh, so it's it's a lot of work and I'm, um, I um, kind of have given up on trying to streamline my process because I realize it just, I'm never happy if I'm cutting corners. So I, however long it takes, it takes. And luckily I'm in a position where I can actually have deadlines that I'm happy with and I can, you know, take the time to, to you know, pick my own projects and stuff. So you usually, you know, I, I say if it's a quick cover or a quick illustration, it's, you know, three days, but on average, I would say it's about five to eight days. And then uh, some of the bigger ones, like with many, many characters, then they can take, I mean, the one that uh, this was a nightmare, but it took me a month. Uh, uh, this really big Avengers poster I did. So it's it's some big, I mean, they're, as you said, actually, they are, you know, whole chunks of my life. And I can actually remember certain parts of my life based on the paintings that I was working on or projects that I was working on at the time. So uh, I don't pump them out. Uh, it's more like, you know, two a month, something like that. Nice. And that kind of ties really directly into my next question is that at this point in your life, you sort of have the ability to pick and choose. And I've, I've read articles and seen interviews where you talk about sometimes that decision is based on the writer that's attached to whatever the material is you're drawing for. And so I'm, I'm just kind of curious, how much influence does the writing, maybe the work samples that you receive have on the actual art output? Like, is it a collaborative back and forth or you kind of just look at the work samples and you're like, okay, I know what this should be. These days, really, the, uh, that, that was more when I was doing, you know, interior stuff and that it was a very, very important that, the you know, the, the, the script is, because if I'm going to dedicate a year of my life to something, I don't want to dedicate it to something I don't like. So uh, it, it really, you know, and I've turned down work before when the script had arrived and, and it just wasn't, you know, and I, I would look at it, I had to really do some, you know, real soul searching and be like, do, do I want to spend the next, you know, eight, 10 months of my life with this that is basically, I can't wait for it to be over. So, uh, you know, I've realized that, uh, you know, in the long run, it would, it would work out better if I was happy with the work I was doing. You know, and then I decided also at one point I never wanted to put out a piece of art anymore that I wasn't happy with because I know that then down the line uh, it, 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 it would just always haunt me. And there are pieces that I've done, you know, back in the past that uh, you know, people bring to me to sign and I, I wouldn't say what it is because they might love it or whatever. But to me, I'm like, oh, God, that's, you know, just terrible. So that's the thing that I, I promised myself I really wanted to avoid and always be proud of what I'm doing. Uh, but these days, it's not so much the writers, it's more just what I can do with a specific thing. So, you know, I get offered some char uh, uh, characters or, or, you know, types of pieces that I'm like, I, I just don't think I'm the best person for this. You know, uh, it doesn't it doesn't have that engineering aspect that I like, you know, engineering a piece. It's more like a thing that, they're, you know, it's not a bad idea. It's just I can see someone else doing it much better and having more fun than I would. So for me, it comes down to like, okay, what, what is it that they're offering for me to do and whether I can do my like spin on it. So that's kind of the main, main my thought process behind what I do. And now you talk about people bringing you things to sign and having different feelings about that, which is totally natural. And a, a curiosity I have is as an artist, do you feel like you're going to continue evolving or do you feel like you've you found your style and is there a fear that if you experiment beyond your style people are like well that's that's not how Addy Granoff should be doing like is there a fear as an artist to explore different things or are you just very happy to be doing exactly what you oh, I mean I I I used to have a, a, a bit of a concern that you know if I went too far out of what I was doing that you know it wouldn't wouldn't be me but it seems like no matter what I do it ends up looking like something I would do 
So when I look at the work from, you know, 10 years ago now, to me it's night and day, but somehow there's a continuity to it. So I constantly push. Uh, every time, in, in the middle of a painting, I have realized something different. And I can't wait to finish it, to start a new one, to start with a new thing. Uh, so I, I definitely am not uh, like the kind of artist who could be, you know, this is my thing and this is what I'm going to do. It's just I definitely do have a natural vision, I guess, for what I want to achieve that stays my own. And so now I don't really care, like, worry about it because I've realized that no matter what I do, it somehow tightens back into, like, the my style. Um, even though, like I said, when I look at it, to me, it looks so different. But to other people, like, oh, yeah, I recognize that immediately as you. So we'll transition to the last piece, and that is the one of one that we really came to talk about today, and that's the all-new X-Men number 16 and that's going to be a one-for-one -one silent auction for people who are maybe new to vv silent auctions are from different artists from around the world and essentially people don't know what each other are bidding and you have a week to put in those bids and there's only one of them unlike with different things on vv there might be whatever 10,000 mints 20,000 mints that means 10,000 editions or 20,000 editions for my physical friends for one of ones there is one only one and so I'm going to throw the all new X-Men number 16 up on screen right now. Can you just walk us through this art piece? You have a lot of different characters, a lot of lighting, a lot of angles. Just talk to us a little bit about the conceptualization of the piece. Why did you choose those angles, those colors, that feel? My wife was a really, really big, big fan of uh, that era of X-Men. So when I was asked, do you want to do 90s X-Men? It was a no-brainer immediately. And, you know, the, the, the cast, the... You know, all of those characters all in one piece, uh, you know, with those specific outfits. It, uh, you know, it was just a total no-brainer just because I knew that she was, you know, such a big fan of it. It, it, it was like, a, again, a, an engineering type of piece to place everything kind of in some harmonious, you know, because pieces with a lot of characters are quite difficult to, so it doesn't look like they're just like standing there in a, you know, crowd. So I always try to do um, almost like a Renaissance type of painting, you know, something quite dramatic with, you know, a dramatic kind of angles and dramatic poses. Uh, and again, you know, dramatic lighting as well. Uh, so that's, that's kind of what I try to achieve really is almost so it looks like, you know, a painting that you could maybe see in a, in a you know, museum, but it, it is the X-Men. I gave everything that kind of almost earthy tone Again, again, that was with this idea that it was kind of that Renaissance style painting. I mean, to get a technical, uh, it's it's raw umber that is kind of a base for everything, and then it's tinted and colored on top of it. So all of that like earthy tone is really raw umber. Really is like a earth. Uh, so that's how I painted it, uh, and you know, obviously tried to give it a more modern edge to to fit the '90s X Men. Yeah, well, overall, that was kind of the idea. It is just trying to come up with like the, the coolest uh, layout that I could. Um, I, I mean, at this point, I can't remember how many layouts I did, but I, I would have worked with uh, uh, an editor who helped pick, you know, one out of the probably three or whatever it was. Uh, and that's the one we, we did. Well, it's amazing. I spent some time prior to this interview trying to find what comic this was on the front. Like, I know it's all new X-Men 16, but I, I used that as a search to try to find the variants, and I couldn't find one. I was trying to, like, do my best to search down one of those comics. I could not locate it. It's, um, uh, it was, uh, uh, French, Panini France, and it was their, uh, 25th anniversary. And actually, it, it's through Marvel, but they are the ones who commissioned it, and they specifically wanted 90s X-Men for uh, a special book and it's been published twice uh, once on a hard a hardcover or it was but it was used to, twice by them but weirdly I don't actually think it was ever used in the US gotcha and that's why it was so tricky to find and I gotta know because your wife was partially the inspiration for what's her favorite character then uh, from this 90s era of X-Men um, it comes in who's your favorite character there we go Rogue and Gambit. Oh, I hope she's not watching X Men '97, right? She, but anyway, she, she we probably can't talk about that too much. Okay, <laughs> once it, uh, yeah, she was quite emotional. 
given we're a collecting platform, Addy, I got to know, what do you love to collect? Do you have a, I see a bunch of stuff behind you. Do you have a, a thing that you really enjoy collecting? I, I, this is the problem. Kind of collect a bit of everything, but I don't have full collections of anything. Kind of collect, I see something I like, and that's what I get kind of thing. So, I mean, most of the stuff behind me is actually stuff I've worked on. So it's my own designs, uh, statues. There's a Darth Vader, a steampunk Darth Vader I designed, and then uh, Iron Man and She-Hulk and stuff. So that's, that's actually work stuff. But, uh, uh, yeah, I have, like, a lot of, uh, uh, 12, um, uh, 12 inch, like, six scale figures that I like. But again, yeah, I have a lot of Iron Man, but they were mostly sent to me because they're based on my designs. So I have a collection, but it's not something that I had, like, gone out to collect. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's kind of like a bit of everything, really. It's wild because it's probably the most valuable collection in the world, too, just because of the limited nature and your you know, connection with it, but that's amazing. And another thing is, do you have any final words for your fans who might be watching that? Maybe are collectors on VV, maybe not. Just any final thoughts for our collector? Well, I mean, my, my own, you know, my thought always is just, uh, you know, thank you so much for, for supporting my work and for, you know, liking it and collecting it. That's, you know, without that, I wouldn't actually be able to afford to do it. So, uh, you know, thank you so much for, for, you know, all the support over the years and, you know, now had a very long career already and uh you know hopefully it continues for a long time uh so yeah that's that's all it's just you know uh i'm, I'm glad that my work resonates with people and uh, i'm glad that you know they, they they like it so that's it and from all of us here at viviati thanks so much for taking the time you know to chat with us and share some of your insights and some of your background your history with our collectors. So everyone viewing at home, did I miss any questions? Should have I asked anything? Just let us know down in the comments and maybe we can have you back on at some point. We can chat again. It was really fun. This is a really good interview. You're, you're really good at it. I, I appreciate you saying that. And with that said, until the next video, everyone, best of luck out there and happy collecting.